Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nicolas Hagemann. I'm a member of the Coordination Office of the Spatial Data Infrastructure in Germany. And I share this presentation together with my colleague, uh, Christian Seib. Um, he's from the service operating teams um, for the STI Germany. And I will start with a quick introduction, give you a short overview of our registry and why um, we have this presentation now, this results now. And then I will hand over to, uh, to Christian. So our topic is um, the, um, our GDE DA registry and uh, Drupal ISO registry module. Uh, we think it's quite a, a powerful tool to uh, make registers within a registry available quite easily. And why we think so, we will show you now in the next 10 minutes. So just to, to set the scene, to get started, um, we have our um, SDI Germany, our National Spatial Data Infrastructure, and it is based on an administrative agreement which um, started in 2006, and it's um, established in, in a national SDI, but we have um, joint funding with our federal states and the national level. Um, we had the first amendment in 2008, which was when uh, we took into account Inspire. Um, so that was the time when the, uh, this coordination structure was established. Um, we had the first update of the uh, agreement in 2013. Um, we decided then to have additional funding for the maintenance of common components. And these are namely four. This was the GeoPortal, our national discovery service, our um, national test suite, and our registry. And this is the point where the operating service was, um, was founded, and this is um, where the registry is operated. We had the latest amendments in 2017, um, where we had a, a permanent contract that governs the cooperation, the organization, the tasks, and the operation, uh, as well as financing. And we have this, this um, annually revision of the service catalog for the components, so we now have the possibility to, uh, to, um, to change and to adapt the changes of the circumstances every year. So the operation office uh, was in 2013 established at our federal agency for cartography and geodesy, in short it's BKG, and it's uh, commissioned with the operation of the national technical component, components, as I just said. The BKG has established a service, service team and unit just for the operation and responsible for the technical and specialist development and continu continuation of the components. The service team is not only the um, technical provider but also collaborates uh, actively in national and international technical bodies, so it's, it's um, a main stakeholder in our STI Germany and a very important um, stakeholder. The components um, and the service catalog are ITIL inspired. Um, so we have some IT uh, process management behind the components. It's not certified, but we of course um, 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 are inspired or, or try to fulfill the ITIL requirements. And together with that comes a, a change management process. <coughs> Um, the change management, uh, pro change management process is part of our service catalog, and um, you, you probably know these uh, changes from idle standard change, normal change, and um, these changes. So uh, we have our registry, which um, needs to be maintained, and there are change requests applied to the registry. And we found out that we require dynamic generic expansion of the components. We, need, we have our registry but we, there's a need for dynamic uh, creation of, of registers. So for example, we have currently uh, two change requests that are implemented. Um, one was uh, the change management for uh, code lists. We have our national code lists in our registry. Another one is the um, schema register, which is already implemented. We have others that are under development, so we need a dynamic um, possibility to create registers in our registry. And we have our existing registry and we have the CRs now coming um, with their uh, needs. So we um, had a look of possibilities how we can expand the registry and this is where the, the Drupal solution comes into play. Um, the operating team found out that with, with Drupal it's quite easy to, to implement 
dynamic registers. And we have them now on top of our regular registry to fulfill the change requirements. And we are now at a state that we ask the question whether this Drupal registry is better than our old registry and will supersede it maybe one day. This is an agreement we have to make for the future. Um, we have to decide and have to discuss. So my colleague now will show you the details of our registry and the Drupal regist registry. And we can then later on maybe discuss if this is something worth for the future to go on with. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, I will show you um, uh, <clears throat> how uh, our existing uh, registry uh, works. It's an ISO 19135 uh, compliant uh, data model and processes, like the uh, future uh, Inspire registry will also have. And it's obviously compatible to uh, German SCI standards and uh, Inspire concepts. And it has a rather user-friendly and multi-language uh, web interface and uh, offers APIs for management, it's mainly SOAP, but uh, to some extent uh, also REST. And it offers a full uh, version control of uh, the content in regards to longevity. And um, one uh, key aspect of it is uh, that it's also used for uh, Inspire the Inspire monitoring of Germany too, which has not that many to do with the re registry, but uh, we also do it with, uh, with our registry. Yeah, um, here's some facts about uh, the ISO 19135 uh, uh, processes and roles. It is to organize information and re register, sub-registers, item classes, items, to manage information and assign responsibilities, uh, submitter, owner, manager, control body, and to maintain information by uh, additions, clarifications, retirements, and supersessions. And to transport this information, for example, in ISO 19135 XML format. We have um, some registers already, uh, like an organization register, a namespace register. N namespace register, uh, in this case, means just uh, some sort of proxy, which uh, um, um, offers one stable URL, like, like the one on top, this one, with uh, some namespaces in it. And then you have an ID, which will be given to the um, uh, uh, service, in this case, for example, a WFS service. Uh, and uh, so this one, this stable URL resolves to this URL and all the, uh, the party in front can be changed, but the uh, URL remains stable all the time. There's also a redentimary uh, codeless register already, then of, of course an Inspire monitoring register. Uh, then some, um, to some extent, schemas are already uh, implemented and there's already or, uh, also coordinate reference systems. Um, which is, uh, will be integrated now. Yeah, that's uh, what uh, the current version looks like. This is uh, exactly the example from this uh, slide. The namespace is, uh, you can see here, how it is configured with the uh, ID resolvers here at the bottom. Here, here you see uh, the, the namespace and so on. So now, uh, why uh, did we choose uh, Drupal uh, to um, make our uh, change requests uh, in a very yeah, dynamic way. Uh, first of all, Drupal is a content management web application framework. Uh, its standard features include easy uh, content offering, including roles and rights. It has a reliable performance and excellent security, and its core principles uh, are modularity, modularity and thus uh, flexibility, uh, what we really, really need. It offers uh, thousands of add-ons, uh, which are called modules there, that expand uh, Drupal's functionality, uh, such as rules, group, and so on. Also, uh, Drupal has more than one million developers, designers, trainers, uh, strategists, coordinators, and other people working on it. So, there are many, many people working on it, and we can uh, profit from there. Yeah, ju just a reminder uh, um, for our codeless register, uh, what Inspire codeless look like. Uh, they are uh, systematic, uh, they have a systematic hierarchical structure, like in this one, mind status. Uh, mind status uh, has a, a code list, which has a code list value, for example, under development, and under that you, f you will find an error one called uh, feasibility, for example. 
And that's uh, about it. It doesn't go any deeper from there so far. And it has, it has uh, output formats like uh, the registry XML format, JSON, and so on. So th that's where we build on. Uh, we wanted an, an codeless register which uh, offers these functional functionalities. And we had uh, code lists like this one, where you can see if, uh, in the first column you have a code list, then some codes, then a label and a definition. So pretty uh, um, simple code list, which will fit uh, quite well into the Inspire uh, code list format. Yeah, and that is uh, the um, solution we uh, worked on so far. It's not uh, um <coughs> very beautiful uh, so far, but it works, and that was uh, the main thing for us. So we have uh, some code lists, and you see there's a content type of Inspire code list, and when I go into one of the code lists, I see all the children there. And also if there are further children, if, if it goes deeper in the hierarchy. So that's uh, um, just the uh, UI, and um, here are uh, the functions which are already implemented. Uh, we can import uh, XML registry uh, format code lists through an upload form. We have a GUI uh, to uh, construct hierarchical, hierarchical uh, code lists. We can export and view code lists in XML registry format. We also have multi-language uh, support. It was uh, partial coding and partial uh, GUI uh, operations. And for the coding, for example, for the code list register, there were only uh, five uh, files needed to uh, implement there. It's available uh, as a module for um, Drupal here. So it's uh, free and open source. Okay. Um, I will skip that. Okay, here's the upload form to uh, upload uh, XML registry format uh, code lists. Here's the code for, for that, it's pretty short. And uh, here is um, the, our main uh, component that you have uh, an, a stable uh, URL with, um, with a code list. And you can say, for example, that you want uh, XML format and uh, the language, uh, as I already said, it's multi-language, uh, multi um, that it's uh, German. And then you have an XML output, which is uh, just like the Inspire registry. Yeah, um, the Outlook, um, we will all also um, support namespaces or proxies. It's already implemented for test. We also have a style register, which is also already implemented, and we are working, working on um, ISO 19135 conforming groups, organization roles, and users. So this is the namespaces, and uh, this is a style register, which will be available soon, hopefully. So I will end here now. In sake of time, uh, we uh, open a room after each presentation for one question. So if there is some direct question to those uh, information you just received, please uh, raise the hand. So you, uh, you add uh, code list entries and, and such. So uh, basically, how are you going to um, synchronize that with, with Inspire code lists? Or uh, is it just for, uh, for national use, these, these extra? items on the code list. Yeah. Uh, we hope so. We, uh, we hope to pers pers uh, participate in the ROR um, movement of Inspire. So to, we have to have a federated uh, registry for code lists also. Yeah, we, we, are, we are going for that. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Etienne Tafouro from uh, BRGM, the French Geological Survey. Um, BRGM worked for, uh, for the Ministry of Environment and uh, we are responsible for the implementation of the metadata catalog and um, the national uh, registry. Uh, I would like to, I propose you to, to present you uh, the state of progress of the implementation of the French registry. Uh, just a quick uh, reminder uh, about the legal framework uh, in uh, Inspire. <coughs> uh, we have to to make available uh, uh, any information uh, like uh, classification, code lists, uh, and so on in uh, in registries, in registers, and. Um, <coughs> And we have 
only one legal obligation uh, related to these uh, registers, uh, which are uh, to to provide uh, extension uh, of uh, Inspire code lists. Uh, an important point is uh, that uh, we uh, we have Inspire code lists and um, classifications, but we have and extensions, but we have also uh, other the need to uh, to publish uh, other types of um, vocabularies, and uh, so we have created uh, the French registry within geocatalog dot offer, and uh, it is uh, complementary to uh, to the metadata catalog. So um, here is the organization uh, of the um, geodata infrastructure in uh, in France. Uh, we are a registry, but uh, we have the same organization for metadata catalog. So we have a national registry, um, which is uh, populated by data providers uh, like BRGM or uh, other uh, agencies like uh, soil agencies, uh, the agencies for French uh, water information system. The COVADIS uh, is uh, a commission to standardization to, uh, to geodata, of geodata. Uh, and an important thing is that uh, we have uh, each of uh, these uh, data providers uh, uh, provide uh, data on zero themes, potentially, and uh, one themes can be uh, managed by by several uh, data providers. So uh, we have uh, we have. Uh, 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 organizational issues, not only um, technical, on this. And uh, we have the French registry, uh, and this registry is in uh, is uh, connected to the to, to the European uh, Inspire registry. So uh, in. Uh, 2017, we have uh, uh, we began to test uh, two soft two open source softwares uh, registry that uh, is uh, developed by uh, the GRC and UK GovLD uh, for uh, that is um, developed by Epimorphix for the UK uh, the UK uh, government. Uh, in 2018, we implemented we have implemented uh, the French registry uh, based on a registry software. Uh, the URL is uh, regist.geocatalog.fr. Uh, we have uh, yet public publish, published uh, code lists on uh, two, two themes. Uh, geology, with uh, code list on borehole uh, information, uh, lithology, and so on, and transport network, for example, surface comp composition, uh, noise, road noise, uh, and so on. And uh, we have uh, we have set up uh, um, the registry uh, for extended uh, Inspire code list. And, link, and linked to the Inspire Register Federation. So we have uh, some issues and needs uh, for uh, first, first of all for register management. Uh, the first objective of the French registry is to provide data providers a tool to manage registers. And provide a URI for these for the these registers. Uh, and 
for that, uh, we need to uh, we need editing fun functionalities and simple workflows to validate published code lists. But we have some providers like uh, BRGM, uh, which have already manage we are are already managing uh, registers in their own uh, registry and with specific URI. Uh, not within geocatalog.fr, uh, but uh, for example for BRGM, data.geosciences.fr. And uh, we see that uh, the French registry can be seen at the Register Federation. In fact, like, uh, like the European uh, Register Federation, uh, we have uh, we need to um, to uh, to link with local more local uh, registries and registers, and uh, we need to to have uh, synchronization mechanisms uh, to uh, to to do that. And uh, this mechanism does not exist uh, actually uh, in the registry software. And uh, technically, we have we have uh, several uh, solutions uh, like uh, Harvest, uh, that is uh, the solution for uh, for uh, for link uh, metadata catalogs, for example. But uh, we have also mechanisms like uh, distributed search. We have to work uh, on uh, on this. So, how uh, data providers? Uh, publish uh, registers in uh, the, f the French registry. We have three types of uh, of uh, publication. We have, um, for example, for BRGM, we have a registry which we who um, uh, data provider. Uh, uh, edit information registers in this re that re registry, and we have uh, uh, we have data provider that um, have to doesn't have uh, their own registry, and they they edit they have to edit directly in the French registry, and. Um, Today is not; uh, it is not possible in the the um, the, the, the last version of uh, registry software. And uh, the light, the last uh, case is um, a data provider that uh, that create that edit in C CSV uh, CSV files, for example, or generate uh, from uh, UML uh, data model or so on. And uh, then import uh, this file in the registry. We have also uh, issues and needs for uh, register access and use. Uh, the registers have to have to be searchable through a user interface for a human uh, uh, users but also by applications. Uh, for example, we, we can, uh, we can implement, uh, implement um, custom uh, user inter uh, interface, or we, uh, we potentially have to, uh, to, to use, uh, to access to the, the code list in uh, editing forms, for example, etc. And in this case, we have to uh, we need um, we need mechanisms, notification mechanisms, uh, to know to know when the the content of the registers change. And we have technical issues, uh, of course, like uh, what format to use, uh, what protocol, and. Uh, we have to solve the performance issues when we have uh, big uh, big registers, for example. 
And uh, an important need for, for, for us uh, is to, uh, to link register with other vocabularies using a proper linked data approach. And uh, we, have, we don't have to redeclaring, we have to avoid redeclaring concepts across registers. It's very important. Okay, uh, here is an example of a register, the Borehole uh, database. And uh, you can see that uh, we have uh, uh, a code list, Borehole Purpose, that is an extension of uh, Inspire uh, code list. And um, potentially we have uh, code list values in these registers and these code lists that can be uh, uh, can be uh, um, uh, the same the same um, concept than in other vocabularies, other standards, or and uh, we ha we have to manage this and support. Here is an overview of, the co of a code list in the French registry for our purpose. And an overview of registries in the Inspire Register Federation. And you can see uh, it's very interest interesting, uh, uh, the, the, the Register Federation, uh, because we can see uh, all the registries declared in the in the federation, and uh, we can see uh, the relations uh, between uh, a register, uh, national register, and an Inspire register. And you can uh, you can also uh, search uh, the into the registers. So, in conclusion, uh, French registry that is based on a registry software, respond to the obligation of publishing Inspire code lists. That is, that's okay. But uh, it has to connect to other tools, like UK GovLD, for example, but uh, we have uh, uh, other, other um, tools uh, to foster a linked data approach and uh, not a tool approach. And uh, we need to improve the system in two ways. First, register management and register access and use. And uh, we have, we have um, technical issues, but uh, I, I insist we have also in BRGM uh, organizational issues uh, because we have to, to involve uh, the, the data providers to uh, to, to manage uh, to manage uh, this, the, their code lists is very important. And what is planned uh, for uh, for 2018 and 2019? We have to upgrade registry from uh, uh, version 1.3 to to version one to version two. Uh, I think it's pla it's plain uh, for uh, early uh, 2019 registry version two, and um, we have to to continue to uh, to pu to publish other uh, code lists in other themes. Uh, again, uh, is there some question directly to the team? If no, I would take this uh, opportunity and. Uh, uh, ask uh, especially for the for the first part where you presented okay where you presented that uh, you have complex structure uh, on the national level that there are for example more providers uh, for uh, one of the inspire teams aren't you planning also in the future uh, uh, to support the mapping of this uh, uh, heterogeneous environment uh, for example, for one team through various providers, also through one of the registers uh, in your registry, or you will keep this sort of mapping outside of the of the registry. 
So for example, if you have team hydrography and you have there at least two or three application schemas, and for each application schemas you have one, more than one data provider, aren't you planning to map this scene also through the registry? Yes, we we have to do this uh, to uh, to do this uh, this work. Yes, yes, and uh, yes. Uh, my name is Javier Lopez from the University of Zaragoza, and I think that the title of my conference is a bit boring because it say advances. Well, uh, maybe the best title should be. Uh, turning the, an idea about persistent identifiers or evolving it into a registry of spatial objects. I think that this, this is better because I want to explain or describe the evolution of this system in Spain since two years ago uh, till now. Well, uh, I think that some, some of you say, okay, this guy already presented this two years ago. True. But in this moment, what I presented? I presented a proof of concept. Because in Inspire, we always said, okay, we are developing an, an infrastructure. And one of the pieces of the infrastructure, which is, we, have, we should have persistent identifiers for the spatial objects. The key question is that to have a persistent identifier, you need to have some central system that keeps track of each spatial object, especially when the spatial object is not available for the users. So this is a huge challenge. How we did it? We created a PAD harvester. That is, instead of just uh, uh, waiting to the data providers to provide us the identifiers of each spatial object, we developed a tool able to harvest the identifier of the identifier from each uh, with, uh, with feature service. And then we published, we published these identifiers through a system that allows us to transform them into an URLs and then users can use the second one, the PAD resolver, to transform the URL into a request to the web feature service that returns a spatial object. You can say, oh, this is quite similar to the real registry from Germany. But it's different because the registry of Germany just applied um, a URL template. You have the ID, you get the URL template, and you get the, the URL to request to the web feature services. This is different. Because what happens is the service chains. What happens is the spatial objects move from an organization to another because there is a change in the responsibilities and so on. So we, we kept track of each object. And this was the proof of the idea. Next, past year, we presented a, a blueprint for a technical framework based on this. And this blueprint required to work to have a namespace registry. So as you can see, we are slowly evolving into a full-fledged registry. But the proof of content that we have presented in 2016 was internal. So we published it in GitHub, because something who is key in this kind of development is that all the code should be public so other entities can test it and learn from the ideas and contribute with new ideas to the system. But the most important thing of this is what happened just uh, after the conference. We presented a draft of a PAD policy in Spain. Here I, go, go, here I am only going to talk about the technical aspects because there are also uh, ideas about governance and issues such as decentralization and so on. But from the point of view, from the technical point of view, there are four big ideas. The, fir the first one, we decided to have or propose a PID URI schema who is uh, aligned with the rules of our um, uh, URLs 
for the for open data because in this case a special is not a spatial is not a special we are data from the point of view of other stakeholders in spain the second we need to have a central namespace registry because in a sense spain is like uh, europe we have a lot of countries and uh, we have a lot of stakeholders and for Having a, a control of the namespaces, we need to centralize it. But at the same time, the number of data providers is too high, and the number of spatial objects, and this is a good question. Somebody knows what is the real, real, real amount of spatial objects in Europe? I think that is over a, more than a billion of them. So the idea is to extend the proof of concept into a system that can harvest all the identifiers from all the inspired available services for the load. And finally, to provide a um, resolver that implement the schema and they use the data from the other two registries in order to resolve the, uh, the URLs according to the common schema into request to the web feature services to retrieve the data. After that, we extended the tool, and we have started to add, okay, you see something fancy, this is the, the front end, but the idea is that the front end is, you can change it. The key is the back end, the services that are behind, because all is based with, uh, all is, is exposed by an API, so can be changed. And the back end has, first, the first thing that is obvious, but we need a registry of all data publishers. And in Spain, it's, it's very funny because, for example, for just a topic, transport networks, we have 93 different entities that are data publishers on with their own control of the, of the, of the public networks. Once we have this, then we can have the namespace registry where they can publish their namespaces. And also, that is also important. A namespace can be composed from different feature types from probably different sources. Why would you think that a namespace has one single source of truth? Maybe for technical reasons could be divided into different uh, services or even the same theme can be shared by different uh, entities that each is responsible for a part of the country, for example. So we need to have this kind of thing associated to the namespace. And finally, with this data, we can have a PID harvester, registry the PIDs with tools to fix them, change the data, whatever, because even the data and the data providers could have some kind of problems. And finally, have a resolver in order to, uh, using the URL, the, URL, the URL schema that I have seen below, resolving to request to the right source. This is from the technical point of view in the back end, but in the front end should be quite simpler. From a user, it should be very easy to register a namespace, then the feature, the feature type source, when we say, okay, the namespace has some feature and this can be found in some service and there are some requests required to in order to get the data automatically and then the system start to harvest the data and when it's ready, it can publish the data in the web but also can resolve the, the URLs into requests to the but, uh, to the feature service. More important of this, I thought that probably we have billions of spatial objects. So this kind of tools should be resilient and robust. And we try to do it. First, he has been designed, obviously, to support multiple organizations with multiple kinds of roles and so on. But also we need to have tools for managing the system, to audit security, to check the health of the system. We need to create robust tools 
because if the tools are not robust, the users will perceive that they are useless for them. Uh, something that is, should, be ca the, should be very clear for us is that we need to have no two nines. We need to have fine nines because Amazon and other services nowadays, they offer fine nines of, av of availability. And for having this, we need to have a lot of tools on that backend for me assuring the health of our tools and applications. Just for ending, our approach is open by default. But why? Because we are learning. Our code is available. The license is open. We have experience. We are trying to learn from the experience and see, okay, this piece is missing, or this piece uh, has problems, or with this kind of services, I don't know how to do it yet. But probably you have some experience in the same, in the same issue, and I'm willing to share my experience with you, and I hope that you can share your experience with us. Thank you. you. Thanks a lot, Francesco. I think uh, this presentation was definitely not boring, and I think you touched uh, one of the uh, most challenging uh, issue in this domain. And uh, really, many thanks for that. And uh, if there is some direct question, please uh, come come with come with that. Just a curiosity: uh, the the PID resolve is in the PID management system. Uh, is based on uh, specific uh, mapping uh, file that you can compile or which is the, 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 the principle that you have behind? I'm sorry. Uh, it uses uh, the, the, the information from the database. And also the idea that this is something that will happen in Spain is that although you have a, a main PID registry, probably local, uh, autonomous communities and so on, they want to have their own. The idea is that have a single source of truth, which is a database, and from this, surfing, for example, from the no, uh, central node of the, 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 ID, the Spanish SDI, the PITs. And if other guys want to, to do the same, they can access to the database and use the database as a base for that. Not files, not so on. Relational. Good morning. Uh, I just present the, the advantage of uh, ISPA, Italian uh, ISPA registry. So uh, last year, Antonio Rotundo from the uh, Agency of uh, Digital of Italy presenting the, the, the real implementation that we have done, of course, based on the, on the registry software. But uh, here we're presenting uh, some uh, step new and also what is the uh, the governance that we set up behind, and the possibility to uh, to the users, to the data provider, to contribute to populate exactly the, the registry. Uh, before I just uh, be to introduce the, the governance that we have uh, at the technical level in Italy. So uh, we have a technical board that's mainly composed by ISPRA, that is the coordination uh, structure plus the uh, agency of uh, Digital Italy. And there are something that uh, is managed directly by us, like uh, monitoring uh, system or validation system. Then there is the metadata system managed directly by uh, digital, uh, the agency of Di Digital Italy. And behind the metadata uh, system and these other elements, become uh, important to have also the, the registry. And the two uh, organization is the main responsible to produce technical guidance at the national level. In this way, if you look into the package that we have in place, uh, is national registry is something that is directly managed by uh, um, the agency, uh, but uh, there is also a board composed by the three uh, coordinator uh, organization, the environmental minister, the my organization, the environmental uh, institute, and the the, the digital uh, 
um, Italy ag agency that governs also the, the procedure to populate the national registry. In fact, uh, we have a, this is the, is the phase of a registry. The registry uh, started in 2017, but uh, the official register is launched just in June of this year. And uh, in July, we, we start in, uh, to federate, uh, to, we are federated uh, to the Inspire registry, of course. Uh, and now we, we, we put in place some activity to populate the, the register. So um, we have also uh, customized the, the, the interface following the national uh, regulation and the national uh, guidelines. And uh, uh, at the moment, we have uh, implemented eight registers. We have, uh, I present some of the three planets uh, that we have. Of course, we, we implement in four languages to take into account the, the border uh, language that we have. Uh, looking to an example, uh, in this way we have uh, the, the register that we want uh, to register in the registry. So we, we prepare uh, uh, a certain, okay, we prepare a certain schema to, to have, uh, this is as an example of uh, our vocabulary, for example, that we use in for monitoring station. So that kind of a, the type of monitoring station. So we have uh, also implementing uh, the mapping between our URI, the operational URI, and the registry URI, to be sure that we have an interlink in between. And for that, this is like, like uh, more or less is uh, the face of uh, one uh, terms that we have uh, in place. Uh, but it's quite important also that we, we put in place exactly the same mechanism that described by Etienne. We have also the possibility to register the national, the, at the local level, so at the national level, different registry uh, that is provided by uh, some companies. So in this way, we activate also the possibility to, to have the register uh, federation to using uh, uh, some other register. This is an example, but of course, uh, we start in now and we, we, we push the other organization to, to register their registry inside the, the national one. This is one mechanism that we can put in place to, to not to replicate effort uh, when we have an organization that have a, a lot of, a, of, a, of a vocabulary or a code list uh, and a lot of uh, resources that we, we need uh, to interlink in together. We have also in place uh, uh, some mechanism to, 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 to refer to the people. So in some way, when we, we're talking about uh, the changes of Inspire Italy register, we, we, we have a uh, specific mail of uh, EGID uh, that is the responsible for that. And then we have also the, the possibility to push uh, through the agency uh, new changes in the national and the Inspire uh, registry following uh, the procedure that uh, is in place in the, in the MIC-T and MIC-P uh, procedures to have uh, some new uh, specific uh, code list that we recognize as a uh, important, uh, especially at the border level. <clears throat> For this, uh, there is also an, uh, uh, an internal discussion in a, in, a, in a section that showed before. There is a the cooperation section coordinated by, by me that is a, a place where we're discussing also at the national level if this one uh, code list is important, not important, to push at an international one. So in some way, we put in place a system to discuss uh, a feasibility to propose something uh, more concrete. And to support also the, the, the national organization, we drive uh, some national guidelines that take into account all the procedures to to put in place from the data and metadata also the service, so all the chain that we have in place. We design uh, the, the, the complete chain, so I'll show you exactly which is the Inspire production chain that we have designed and revised. And also in these guidelines, we're proposing uh, uh, specific uh, uh, guidelines to the namespace, the special object persistent identifier definition, and some other elements that is strongly related to the register. Uh, 
this is more or less uh, what I, we, we design as a, as a inspired production chains. So in most of the case, uh, uh, we are in this position where we have the metadata for existing uh, uh, data set as service, but uh, now we have a tool to rewrite or to re, uh, re, give you a new face, taking account the harmonization of data, of course. So in some way, we have to follow the, the chain to harmonize the data, validate the data, and then producing the, the new metadata, taking account of this, uh, these procedures. In this way, it's quite important for us the, the persistent identify because all the metadata, all the special objects in the data set and the service are consistent with the registry. So we, we have a system to identify uniquely each object. In this way, we have a, uh, also starting to define uh, how to declare a namespace. So when you want to propose a namespace, so you, you propose the namespace, the version, the description, the, 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 the owner that uh, manages these, uh, these resources, and also a contact uh, uh, information to contact him for more uh, concrete uh, questions. And this is also implementing uh, in, the, in the guidelines. This is an example how we we propose also how to fill uh, the, the possibility to introduce the, the code list in, the, in our registry. In fact, uh, you see that uh, this is a, a couple of sample of a, of a, of a namespace that uh, we, uh, we write. Uh, there is the, 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 the label, the, the, the registry uh, URI, and also, also in this case, the mapping uh, with the, the operational URI for namespace. From these, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have to take in account uh, exactly the discussion that uh, presenting by the Francisco, the persistent identify. So, for, call, uh, to go back uh, to yes, the previous year, yes, uh, uh, the last year I presented something about that. Uh, there is an opportunity to us to, to make uh, a schema to produce this uh, pers persistent identify for the spatial object also for the, for the metadata. For the metadata, it's more or less is quite simple because uh, we're using uh, a prefix uh, IPA. IPA is the public administration index that we have built uh, uh, several years ago in Italy, also for financial uh, questions. So all the metadata have a prefix that uh, identify which is the organization that provide the metadata. And then there is a uh, schema to, to produce, uh, for example, the, the idea of, uh, of this uh, metadata. But we're using the same approach to propose something for the special object. So you see an a couple of examples, my organization, a regional agency, uh, the Emilia Romagna Regional Agency on the Environmental Protection, where we have uh, our IPA code. And we're using uh, in the uh, persistent identify of an object taking account uh, the, the database where they're coming and also a feature uh, number that we have. So in this way, we have a, a unique identifier that is quite useful to recognize, but it's also quite useful for a regional system. We are as a regional system. In most of the cases, we have the opportunity to create uh, the, the national report taking account of the regional uh, part, so we not replicate the object. We're just linking the object inside the national one. So in this way, we have a very flexible system to, to not uh, have a, a weight uh, file in our database. So this is also the other region why we're using this type of a, of, a, of a code. To go to the conclusion, or which is the more or less next step that we have in place, uh, we start to import some vocabulary defined by ISPRA, so probably in the next months we including all the vocabulary that we have defining uh, also for the link data project. We have several. Uh, we evaluate the best solution to manage the direct URI. So my question for, uh, from Francisco is quite important because one important thing is the pin resolvable. There is some PIT service uh, av available on the web like uh, CSRO PIT service or uh, something, something else. 
and we have to decide which is the best solution to not have an egg impact uh, also in the, in the single administration, because most of the administration, the national, we have more than 8,000 uh, 8, administrations, so manage, manage that is quite complex. Could be possible for the national one, like me, but probably we have to find a flexible solution. And then we need to acquire all the namespace that coming from the, all the public uh, administration that uh, have a role in Annex 1, 2, and 3. And this way, yes, we have uh, already mapping uh, the each administration with teams. Thank you. Thank you, Carlo. Definitely, also your uh, presentation conf confirms that uh, uh, all those authorities uh, dealing with the management of registers uh, have to face quite challenging uh, uh, period, especially in connection to those PIDs. And uh, with that, also, I would like to open the discussion for this uh, particular presentation. If no, then maybe I would like to ask you, uh, uh, I was quite uh, impressed with the way how you manage this governance framework because uh, uh, aside of the technical challenges, sometimes it's also quite uh, crucial to make sure that you have uh, all uh, stakeholders uh, on the board and involved. And with that, I would like to ask whether you think uh, uh, from your experience uh, there is uh, something what uh, uh, would be uh, possibly... Um, reusable also in other countries, especially bearing in mind that what's really crucial to make sure that you get uh, all, all important uh, players uh, on your side uh, cooperating to achieve this, uh, let's say, uh, common agreement. Thanks. Thanks for the question. I mean, it's not easy manage. Yes, we map the, all the, the, the public authority that have a role. Is Manage in the right way this public administration is not exactly a simple way, and we not manage all in, a, in any case. But in some way, we have uh, the board, and we try to discuss uh, a little bit the board in some ways, uh, the national board and the technical section that is uh, the, the real place where the administration can, uh, can discuss, is in place, uh, born very late, from my point of view, but uh, we starting to do. I mean, I don't know if it's, it's something that's reusable in other contexts, but uh, because also this is more related to the public relation with the single public administration. I mean, uh, most, uh, most of, uh, of a national uh, organization have the sensitivity to understanding the importance of these topics, and we're starting to cooperate more than before, for sure. When we go to the local level, we have more complexity because in most cases they haven't uh, the, the, the resources to do that. So uh, we, we, we have to plan now the, which is the, the best uh, solution to, su to support them. Because in most cases, the municipality, if not talking about the, the, the main city, have a lot of questions on the desk. Uh, hello. Um, well, my name is Etim Wisse. I'm from, uh, from the Netherlands. I'm going to tell you something about uh, management of code lists. And I'm not going to tell you uh, much about uh, Inspire because it's only, well, um, it's related to Inspire. Um, I've got, um, I'm going to tell you first something about water management in the Netherlands because there are some, there's some background uh, which led to, uh, to, to the standard which we now have. I'm going to tell you something about uh, the, the standard for, for water information, which we have in the Netherlands, in relation to our international standards, um, what it consists of, a model, code lists, and something uh, basically about the process of, of managing such a standard. Because I think that, that in Europe we need a management process for, for a standard, and especially for code lists as well. Um, and then I'm going to tell you something about uh, the relation between reporting and code lists. Um, my, uh, my colleague, who, whose name is also on this, Johan Steep, um, he basically raised the question uh, whether uh, we deal with code lists in the right way. That his, in his experience, for his water quality reporting, uh, he needs a lot of code lists which are also external to Inspire. So, um, 
and I'm going to tell you something finally about uh, the next steps and the future. Well, first of all, about uh, water management in the Netherlands. Um, the ministry in the Netherlands is, re is responsible for the coastal defense, which is, for, of course, very important because the Netherlands is partly below sea level and responsible for the main waterways. But main, the, the main part of the actual uh, well management of the water system is the responsibility of the so-called water boards. And the water boards uh, are a bit different than, than uh, organizations in other countries because the water boards are actually older than, than the Dutch state itself and they're not uh, under any, any uh, ministry. So basically the water boards are uh, independent governmental institutes which uh, manage the, uh, the, the water quality and uh, the amount of water uh, which is being uh, uh, distributed in the Netherlands. And this summer we had a very dry summer, so there was a very important role at that point to make sure that um, the, the farmers in the Netherlands got enough water. And then uh, at that point there has to be uh, well, coordination between the ministry, which basically does water at the national level, and all those different water boards. Groundwater on the other end and provincial waterways are being uh, well uh, managed by, by the provinces. So uh, what you see is that, that we've got all these different institutes uh, which are also not under the same uh, ministry which have a joint responsibility for water and a joint responsibility for uh, well um, reporting the state of the water uh, to Europe. And that made standardization in an early uh, stage uh, necessary in the Netherlands. So, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, I work for the Informatiehuis Water, the, the Water Information Center uh, is the term in English. And basically, we are responsible for the reporting of the, uh, the state of the water to the European Union. So, that's, that's a, a different scope than, than inspire, just Inspire. Um, in the Informatiehuis Water, people from the ministry, water boards, and the provinces work together. And we've got a mission statement. It's our uh, task to make uh, information flow as efficiently and effectively as the water itself. So, um, how is it organized with standards in the Netherlands? Well, first of all, uh, at the top we've got the uh, international standards. And um, in the Netherlands, the, uh, these are uh, the GeoNovum, which organizes this conference. And uh, NENEN are the representatives of the international uh, bodies. And under that are um, the different uh, domain standards. They're all building on the uh, ISO standards, INSPIRE standards, national standard by GeoNovum. And one of these is the information model for water, which is the one I'm going to talk about. Um, so what's the ARCO standard? Well, it consists of a model, uh, it consists of code laced, and it consists of a vocabulary where, we, uh, where the, the definition of the actual terms is, uh, is shown. We've got a yearly procedure, we've got a process which has been uh, accredited in the Netherlands by the uh, Forum Standardisatie, that's why they're over there, that's a, a national body which decides which of the standards are uh, on an apply or explain list. So um, most of these standards here are on the explain, uh, apply or explain list and they have to adhere to the uh, standards which are set by the forum standardization. Um, well, this is just to show you how the, uh, the, the model, how it hangs together. Um, for us, the, the information model for measurements is a very important one. That's the one for the water quality. And interestingly, this is one we managed together with another uh, organization in the Netherlands who are uh, responsible for soil quality and for water quality in the soil. So, um, as you can see, the, 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 the management of a standard involves a lot of coordination. So how, do we, uh, how is this process being, uh, how is it being managed? Well, we've got a yearly process where twice a year uh, we, uh, the requests for change are being uh, brought into the, the, the standard. Uh, a user first has to uh, well, apply uh, a request for change. Then we check whether there's a, a, a component uh, which is relevant to a certain domain. 
and we've got then it goes to an expert group if it does and we've got expert groups on chemistry another on ecology on one on water system and the the dike system and one on wastewater and these are experts from from the different domains and they decide whether uh, a request for change is going to be uh, is, is worthwhile if it has a technical component, so if it's, for example, about an exchange format, it goes to a technical committee. And we've got technical working groups for both the measurements uh, part and for the other parts. Uh, we've got this joint process together with, uh, with the, uh, the soil um, organization and with RioNet, who are uh, basically uh, responsible for the information systems of the uh, municipal wastewater systems. So what is the, uh, the issue that we uh, found? Well, um, my colleague from, uh, he's responsible for, uh, example, for reporting the, the water quality of the marine environment. And in his an experience, um, he has to use a lot of different code lists from, from the many different sources for his reporting. So um, we have, in the Netherlands, we have extended the scope of the ARCO standard to, uh, to basically uh, allow his, his reports to be made. But when he makes the report for the European Union, basically he has to map the, uh, the ARCO code lists to a lot of uh, different uh, code lists which are out there. Um, for the ACO standard, we're now moving from, uh, from lists, from code lists, to semantics. And I think that's a very important development. Um, because well, one of the things we have to do is to harmonize between the different uh, domain models in the Netherlands. I said something about RioNet, who are, waste, who are responsible for the wastewater information uh, model. And we found that we've got a lot of terms in our different uh, code lists, which actually uh, are the same. For example, uh, well, um, as you can imagine, uh, we've got in the water system, we've got the, the same kind of water pumps as they have in the wastewater system. So basically, we both have got a definition for, for wastewater. And uh, our idea is that, that we had to uh, harmonize this. But since uh, last year, we went to, uh, to a linked data environment, we found that it's actually much easier to uh, just refer to each other because linked data gives you the, 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 the opportunity to point to another vocabulary and just say, well, you can find a term there, then you say it's a related match, or you can say, uh, use the other term, so don't use my definition, but rather look for the other definition. And it's all, well, machine uh, usable, so uh, it's actually a very good for way forward, and it offers you a way to, um, to uh, integrate with other vocabularies without having to, uh, to harmonize, without having to agree to a common uh, definition. So um, it has given us the, the idea that a similar process for uh, international management of code lists might also be an, uh, an option where you can uh, basically, where we can basically uh, refer to uh, Inspire code lists or other international code lists and uh, thus allow Dutch users uh, it, during reporting to use the Netherlands, the N Dutch code lists, rather than the international ones. And because the international code lists refer to one another, we can achieve interoperability using linked data. Now for the future, um, we move now from a, a linked, uh, from a layered model where the code lists, the vocabulary with all the definitions, and the model itself, uh, well, it all goes into linked data space, making it, uh, well, a bit more, more fuzzy, but uh, we find that it's a great improvement because it's, it's more closer to how we use language ourselves. Um, we need these international code lists. Uh, we, we need a, 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 an international standard, a European standard, to which we can refer. And uh, basically we think that um, we also need a, uh, a management process similar to, to the process we've got in the Netherlands, uh, this accredited process by the Forum Standardization, to make sure that, uh, that we've got a common standard which we're all referring to. So, um, well, I wanted to, to 
end the presentation with a couple of questions. What's, what's the current situation per country? Well, luckily in a lot of the presentations today, uh, I got the, the answer already. And uh, uh, I wanted to end with the, uh, well, the, the call to, uh, to have a look at the uh, international level now. And uh, I was, was delighted to hear some of the presenters here today uh, end with the same uh, question. So I think we uh, should get together after this, uh, after this workshop and uh, exchange some ideas. That's all. Well, for every, if you're interested in a demo for our uh, new linked data system, uh, it's an open source linked data system based on the uh, system by uh, Developer Cadaster, Link Data Theater it's called. Uh, I'm happy to show it to you after the uh, after this uh, uh, session, and uh, to tell you more about uh, our standard and our management process. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Edwin. Uh, I think it was very nice use case uh, how. Uh, semantic technologies and standards might help uh, in process of achievement of consensus in across the domain and also within the domain. Uh, so again, uh, some question for this presentation. If no, I would have one. Uh, when you're saying that you are applying some ontologies to find some sort of mapping across the various concepts, these ontologies uh, you already f used from uh, from the world outside, or you you came with the new one uh, based on your experience. Uh, for the linked data mapping, we used uh, standard ontologies, and uh, well, using an ontology, um, you basically you're making your own ontology by the choices you make in other ontologies. So. Um, we stuck to the uh, definitions which were defined by Cadaster uh, for their uh, for their uh, for their framework. For their uh, so basically, we, we uh, stick as much to the uh, ontology uh, choices made within the Dutch uh, framework, and we have to make some extensions. But thankfully, in in linked data, it, it encourages you to make extensions because you can still uh, by by sticking to the, uh, the the standard ontology choices you make sure that it's, it's findable within the other context. Mm -hmm. And you can still uh, freely uh, explain more about your, uh, your information. So uh, you have to choose carefully there. So it's, uh, it's a good question. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Clinton Smythe, and I'm the CEO of Minerva Intelligence Limited. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, one of whom, Jake uh, McGregor, is sitting in the audience. <coughs> uh, Minerva Intelligence is a private company focused on bringing the uh, benefits of artificial intelligence technology to the mining industry and other uh, industries dependent on reasoning with complex technical and scientific terms and concepts, such as natural hazard mapping, mineral exploration, environmental monitoring, urban and regional planning, um, and insurance. Uh, there are many aspects to artificial intelligence, some of them represented in that, in that graphic. Many people think it's synonymous with machine learning. It's not. There are many other aspects. In particular, one of the challenging ones is getting human intelligence into a machine and using that, reusing that knowledge uh, interoperably with very large databases. So Minerva's special uh, emphasis is on embedding human knowledge in machines. There are many cognitive problems that do not have enough training examples for solutions by machine learning. So typically we like to distinguish between very difficult problems that machine learning is very good at, which are perception type the kind of things that human beings can do in seconds. We look at a face and recognize it. Um, but the bigger problems we have to think about and relate many different concepts in our minds before uh, coming up with a decision or a recommendation. So as a result, um, we're interested in, in, at the bottom level, terminologies and how they relate to each other, ontologies, semantic networks for representing knowledge and, uh, and data. And then reasoning with that 
sometimes uh, incorporating uncertainty, always incorporating logic programming, and coming up with conclusions and advice uh, for, for people who, who see value in those. This doesn't mean that we are not involved in machine learning, and the graphic shows that one of the areas we're very active in is extracting features from airborne magnetic surveys, for example, which is a machine learning task. And interestingly, um, terminology is very important for that as well because when you train the machine learning, you've got to tell it what features you want it to extract so that you can reason with them later. Human knowledge resides in literature. It requires knowledge engineering technologies to express on computers. And, and this crowded graphic tries to explain that what we do is we extract knowledge from the scientific literature using ontologies that are based on conceptual models. This is a conceptual model of a mineral deposit. And these are some of the documents that we have to give our knowledge engineers to organize the knowledge when they extract it from uh, scientific literature before they enter it into the computer. And these are the taxonomies and knowledge summaries that we refer to taxonomies of tectonic setting and the periodic table and, and such like. Terminologies are the building blocks of knowledge and along with numbers and images, they are the fundamental elements of communication between humans and humans and between humans and machines. Ontologies express fundamental permissible relationships between terms such as a class and a subclass the fundamental term for ex uh, a fundamental relationship is between a class and a subclass or a part and a whole and then permissible ones such as how you may use minerals to qualify what a mineral deposit is composed of and then semantic networks are simply the knowledge representation uh, frameworks we use for representing conceptual knowledge or descriptions of particular instances or places on the ground so some of the technologies that are used for this are, are rather alienating to uh, specialist scientists or, or users of our data, but I just include this slide to show what they look like. This is typically what an ontology editor looks like, um, not something a domain expert really likes to work with. And this is a semantic network. It's just part of a, a single semantic network describing a single mineral deposit. You can see it's got many different nodes and edges. So our high-level helicopter view of our, our system architecture will emphasize the importance of the Minerva, I uh, beg your pardon, the uh, Inspire terminologies because basically the heart of our system is a reasoner here which produces maps or explanations um, that are useful to people, be they target maps or pollution maps or whatever. Um, and, and the system can provide advice and to a limited extent at the moment even argue with an expert who will say it's coming up with the wrong advice. Uh, we can actually answer back and say why a particular polygon is more suited or better than the one the expert thinks should be. And we trace that back through logical principles all the way back to the terminologies that are either on the input maps or in the knowledge that we've captured at the conceptual level. So the critical key here is uh, in alignment terminologically with the input data, which comes from public and private databases, with the terminology we've used to capture the knowledge in an interoperable way. And this is often a bottleneck, but, but Inspire is, is systematically removing that bottleneck, especially for us in Europe, and that's why we're a Vancouver company, but we're working in Europe, because you're way ahead of Canada and the United States in terms of uh, standardizing. So um, here's an example application. Uh, mineral exploration targeting using the techniques I've been discussing we're able to capture knowledge from the US Geological Survey for example where they've published 85 different conceptual models for mineral deposit types and we're able to do a job for the Yukon a completely different uh, jurisdiction put it uh, align the terminologies because they were different put it into the reasoner and produce 85 different target maps for geologists one target map for each conceptual model great example of reuse of knowledge, fund absolutely dependent on standardization of terminology. Another nice example is one where it's incomplete that we're working on at the moment is hazard level maps for contamination from abandoned mines in the EU. Uh, what you see on the right is an extract of a map showing potential hazard levels from a, a mine facility in this case. Um, 
and it's based on the land use lithology distance from the mine facility and what I neglected to put in here was uh, as well the semantic network describing the kind of mine mineral deposit that's contributing to gas and uh, underground water leakage and so on in that area. Um, and of course this semantic, the, the map is uh, kind of, it should be cold to hot colors uh, indicating which, which polygons are most subject to, to pollution hazard as a function amongst others of distance from the mine and this is all done by comparison of the semantic networks describing the polygons um, with the knowledge of the contamination source. However, this work is suspended because of logical inconsistencies and other shortcomings of the Inspire land use classification, the Hilux system. It's not, when we work with it, it actually produces uh, results that we can't defend with experts. So a decision was taken to re-engineer the Hilux system to comply with the principles of Aristotle. So what are the principles of Aristotle? They're well represented in this 2018 textbook on artificial intelligence. I refer you to it. At, uh, here, here's, it's a available for download, actually, the whole book. Um, basically, Aristotle told us thousands of years ago that the difference between a class and a subclass is simply the differentia in the subclass that make it different from the properties it inherits from its uh, superclass. And if you don't obey that, you come up with a taxonomy that doesn't work, and Hilux is a great example of one of those. This slide, I'm running out of time, uh, is just an introduction to the Hilux, a part of the Hilux classification. It only has three levels in the Inspire version, um, as it is. In summary, our re-engineering re is a transformation of the Hilux fir uh, first in, we deconstruct it first into a spreadsheet in which we make all the unique attributes of each uh, node in the taxonomy explicit. This matrix is then imported into an ontology editor and subjected to a reasoning engine and there are a number of open source ontology editors such as Composer and Protégé from Stanford University. You can uh, reason with all the definitions for each term that your expert has given you and Hermit or, or um, Pellet are the two reasoners that we use and generate a multi-hierarchical, completely logical, con logically consistent taxonomy for your domain of interest. However, it does involve two or three, ideally three people, uh, at least one subject matter expert. Uh, you have to have an ontology expert who knows how to use protege or composer. And here is the workflow. It goes much better if you have a, uh, a, sem a semantics trained person, such as a linguist, who can work between the subject matter expert and the taxon, I beg your pardon, the, the, the software engineer who's working here. Typically, you go through quite a few cycles here before you can come to a final uh, audited Aristotelian taxonomy. And because uh, Protégé is such a user-unfriendly environment for an expert to work in, we've developed open source software called the Aristotelian Class Editor or Explorer to make it friendly uh, for the expert to actually examine the taxonomy that's come out of the reasoner and, and maintain it. So here are definitions of the more detailed definitions of the people you need in the team, minimum people you need in the team. And this is the kind of work they've got to do. Uh, this, is, this is an extract from our current work on the Hilux. And you can see lots of highlighting, lots of arguing about terms, recognition of inadequate definitions of the, of the actual term to make it different from another term. You get it all down on paper, get it into an Excel spreadsheet, take it into Protégé. Uh, this is uh, just an extract of the, the very big spreadsheet that you need to work with Hilux. And in fact, Corrine, the land cover, has a lot of terms that, 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 that are in there at the moment if, if it's going to be done the way the, uh, to conform with where Hilux was trying to go. Um, so this is what the uh, Aristotelian class explorer looks like. Makes it much easier for a domain expert. He can come in and drill down uh, his taxonomy, his final taxonomy, in a multi-hierarchical way, starting with any, kind, any, any attribute. If you're in geology, you can start with genesis of the rock type or um, texture or chemistry. It's multi-hierarchical. And any time you, you reach a node or an intermediate node, you can click on that, see what the attributes are that make it unique. And many of those attributes themselves come from another taxonomy. You can click on the attribute and its value and what will... Uh, you click on that line and what will pop up over here is the taxonomy that these values were being pulled from. 
So it, it really is a, a, a circular thing that you have to deal with, but it's a, we find that uh, domain experts are very comfortable in this environment. There are three of them, if you want to play around with them, three that are uh, live on the internet at the moment uh, within the software. It's still in beta, but anyone who wants it can get it from us. The, um, the code is on GitHub. I don't have the link here, but you can see these are the ones that we're working on now. We're working on Hilux. We coming up, we, we're developing a new classification of mineral deposits because we think we need it. And the Earth's resources, Earth materials uh, inspire code list is actually the one that's online there now is the one that's current in Inspire. Interestingly, that one dates back to about 2008 when we cleaned it up with the logic workflow that I just described uh, in the days when Steve Richard and GeoCiML and the CGI were looking after that taxonomy, which was adopted in its entirety by Inspire. Uh, there are many, many other taxonomies that need restructuring. This Aristotelian workflow is appropriate to all of them. If you look around the disciplines, even outside of Inspire, you'll see that the minerals people have got problems, FAO's got problems, and most recently, the life sciences. This is a really vive, uh, very alive correspondence going on now. The life sciences people trying to sort out their taxonomies. Um, so our view now, as we work with them, is that Aristotelian compliance is a necessary discipline for, for all the inspired taxonomies uh, as time goes by. Thank you. If no, I would have one. Uh, I have to admit that this is for me completely new domain, but I was quite uh, impressed with uh, uh, with approach which you are trying to to apply also on the sort of knowledge coming from the Inspire. Uh, based on your uh, skills and experience, uh, seeing the utilization of the artificial intelligence in the in the private sector. Uh, do you see yourself as a pioneer or, uh, or, or there is already a lot of players and competitors in this field just to better understand the, the scene in, the, in that field? There are, a great, there are a great many players in this field, but I think that 70 or 80% of them are working on machine learning. And, and the machine learning people have made fantastic strides. But if you look at the cutting edge of the machine learning people, what they're starting to do with deep learning is trying to inject semantics into their machine learning to make it better. And so I wouldn't say we're at the cutting edge, no, but we, we think it's the future. <laughs>